Was Hello. loud. <laughs> oh. All right. That's <laughs> <laughs> I, I now have a microphone. Ho, ho, ho. I will. There we go. Uh. Uh. <laughs> all right, all right, we're good. We're all good, we're all good. So I haven't prepared any questions, so hopefully I won't uh, <laughs> get stuck. I think we'll be able to... How long do we have? <laughs> um, we can always just uh, complain about stuff. If okay, I'm going to topic. complain about stuff. Yeah. Uh, go on. That's my, that's my <laughs> <laughs> so, so I guess maybe we can start there, actually. Um, well, um, Rob Ashton, introduce yourself. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm Rob, and um, I haven't got an elevator pitch for myself at the moment because I've recently gone, undergone a transition, and oh, yeah. I've become a real person living in the real world again. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> and I've not quite worked out how to tell people about that. Right, so, yeah, it was interesting watching your keynote because, um, I th yeah, it sounds like someone who found Jesus. Not to <laughs> offend anyone, but, uh, but actually you found Haskell. So, so tell us about that. Well, I, uh, there was a picture of Moses in my, in my slides. So <laughs> it was a revel revelation. Um, well, I don't think really Haskell has, a, has too much to do with it, but although it does, right. obviously. Um, three or four months ago, I hit a wall with regards to my traveling activities. I've been traveling an awful lot, two years of being homeless and... Living out of a suitcase takes a toll on your health. It's time to sit down and think about that. Yeah. And at the same time, I realized I had no side projects either. And I'd learned some closure, functional style, and I tried to have a look at Haskell. And since getting into Haskell and really making an effort to learn it, it has changed the way I approach learning in most other ways too. Right, yeah. So, so it goes beyond this programming. Like you were talking about learning the guitar. And yeah. So... When I was asked to give the keynote at that conference, I was uh, not really sure what I wanted to say yeah. because I wasn't really in a place where I was excited about anything. I'm building software, and I'm building software every single day. I've been had the same kind of job for the year for a year now. Where I just build software every single day, which is which is great fun. But I don't really want to talk about any of that because it's just work, which makes money and, yeah, yeah. and makes people rich. It's not it's not exciting. So I decided to try and crystallize some of the things I've been saying over the past few years into something that was tangible and listenable. And I realized that there was a transformative moment a few months ago whereby the Haskell thing had made me reassess how I'd learned other things in the past. Yeah. And the two key things which I started to go up again were climbing and guitar. Now the guitar's boring, that's, that's not... <laughs> not very exciting. Everyone saw me badly do it yesterday with the... Uh, <laughs> I made good use of the practice, I think. Well, I was, funny enough, actually, I can't sing and play the guitar at the same time. Otherwise... Well, that's I'd a different skill, so... Well, I mean, you kind of did it. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, strumming it doesn't really count. When I, when, I mean, when I say play the guitar, I'm, I mean finger-picking and scales mm. and reading music right. and playing yeah. actual tunes yeah. and things. But, we, but we don't play, we don't think about that, because we haven't got to <laughs> over that hump yet. You know? <laughs> <laughs> to us, it's playing. But the climbing thing was more interesting because that actually had an instructor involved. And it was right. the instructor who said to me, Rob, you're going to jump in too fast, I see you monkeying up the walls, and perhaps you should think about not doing that. Right. And perhaps you go to these easy walls over here and practice doing it with one hand or using just two fingers and focus on where your feet, where, your, where the balance goes on your feet and focus about your body position and, and how you actually hold yourself against the wall. And I was like, well, that's really interesting because obviously I can go up walls, but I also know that last time I tried doing this, I hit a plateau very quickly. Yeah. And that plateau is very similar to the plateau that you reach when you're writing crappy enterprise software day in, day out and not really learning anything new. You you're just throw things together and you reach a point where you're competent at throwing things together, but yeah. you're, not, yeah. you're not changing the world. You're not making anything better. You're just shuffling no, code around the place. Especially and not yourself. Sorry? You're not making yourself better either. Well, no. So, well, yeah. You know, pasting stuff together. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, your work doesn't have to do that, right? I mean, um, 
my day job isn't going to blow anyone away. The right. work yeah. I do is not revolutionary. It's, no, no. It makes a couple of companies who are very big make a lot of money and therefore make us some money too. And yeah. it's not exciting. And I wouldn't say my day job betters me at all. Right. But what I do outside of my job influences what I do inside my job. And that's the important thing. Yeah. Well, I recognize myself in, in the discovering that I don't know how to learn things. And uh, I think maybe we have kind of the same background that I learned programming when I was like early teens, a teenager uh, and a kid, because I wanted to make games. Like, and uh, I learned it by just doing it and like making a mess and learning. And I never really like stepped back and thought about like the theory behind it and, and did it right. And I learned all these things wrong. And in the same way, I, I uh, used to play the drums. Uh, now I don't that much, but uh, I also learned the drums just by hitting things with sticks. And uh, if you actually like, want to learn like, more complicated things, you're going to reach a plateau, just like with climbing. Like, you can't really do it. Absolutely. It Unless doesn't, it doesn't hold true for everybody, obviously. There yeah, are yeah. natural geniuses out there who picked up their instrument or, or, or weapon of choice and were instantly amazing at it. And that's fair yeah. enough. You know. Hats off to those people, but most of us aren't those people. Yeah. No. And especially with programming, we're not those people most of the time. No. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just like you. I learned programming to make games when I was six. Yeah. Been programming ever since. And not actually learning it, because obviously I always knew better. Right. You know, yeah, yeah. During yeah. university, why am I learning this crappy pointer stuff when yeah. I know it already? And I can look, I've written a 3D engine, isn't that exciting? Yeah, yeah it exactly. works. Um, <laughs> it works, it looks it's great. Mm -hmm. Obviously the code's awful. Yeah. Um, I think it's great at the time, but I know it's awful now. But it's not awful. Um, I don't think it's awful because I've learned stuff since then. I think it's awful because it wasn't a product of deliberate learning. Right. Mm. Like you can tell that you didn't know what you were doing. Like, mm. And I feel it's del deliberate learning that makes a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and it's so uh, rare to take the time to do that. Yeah. It? Well, it's difficult. Yeah, yeah. Um, I keep, you know... I was in Hadi's talk earlier today, you know, Hadi Hiri. Yeah, yeah, I was also seeing... Was right, also okay. And he mentioned what Hanselman said on Twitter about functional programming being too difficult for the common layman, blah, 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 etc. Yeah. Boring. And, and that was a, actually a perfect example of what I was talking about, which was, right. well, yes, it is difficult. Um, it is difficult to learn things that haven't made everything incredibly easy to digest. Yeah, doesn't mean it's not worth putting the effort in. Yeah. So that yeah. when you come to do the hard things, they're easy by virtue of having travelled the hard way. Um, yeah. Yeah, I feel like often we try to like make things easy to learn at the expense of power and like the advanced user get crippled. Yeah, instead. or you just like, don't understand how it actually works. Yeah, That's exactly. Whereas like some things like Haskell are like uncompromising, like you know, and I can. I, I think there are some there are some people who disagree with you there about Haskell being uncompromising. Uh, that's a, that's a, on on a on a sliding scale. You, yeah, 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 you know, of course. On, on one true. end you have data grids in WinForms, yeah. yeah. and on the other end of the scale you have maybe Idris or something like that. Right, and Haskell or ATS or, comes yeah. to yeah comes towards that mm -hmm. absolutely. But yeah. I wouldn't say it's uncompromising. Yeah, but it, like you you kind of have the same reaction. Like I had the same reaction as I think you had. Like when I looked at Haskell the first time. It felt like I didn't know how to program, which really, like, I had to question myself. Like, why is this so difficult when I, you know... like When like programming said, is already so easy to me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. And it's a, it's a strange experience, and I can see why it would be such a, such a like, changing experience. So, how, how has, like, this insight uh, changed the way you program? Because... Uh, are you programming only in Haskell now, or are you? No, no, no. So my day job is mostly Erlang, right. with the occasional hint of C. So um, Erlang is also interesting. <laughs> it looks like a no. <laughs> <laughs> Erlang is actually incredibly boring. Oh, really? um, oh. Anyone who thinks otherwise is, I don't know what they're thinking. Um, well, probably I haven't really looked at Erlang. I've just looked things about Erlang? I think it's so boring because it is actually incredibly simple. Right. Um, we, we use it for everything. Most things at our job is, is Erlang. And it solves a bunch of problems of some dispute systems. It makes messaging really easy. Right. Um, some functional things are in there. 
Yeah. A lot aren't. Yeah. I find any kind of logic in Erlang almost impossible to write. Just oh, be, really? Yeah. It'll, um, because it's based on prologue, so it should be good at that. <laughs> I think business logic is different from the kind of logic you might espouse oh, in right, prologue. Yeah, um, right. A classic example of things that frustrate me in Erlang, I, I know one in particular. In Haskell, one of the first things you learn is um, not to write your own recursive functions. Right. You always use a fold, um, either L or R, or any kind of generator function. Yeah. You don't tend to write your own. In Erlang, those things do exist over some data types, such as lists, but the syntax is so ungainly for that, you end up uh. writing mostly your own recursive functions over and over again. Ouch. And there's lots of little things in Erlang that you start missing very quickly from languages like Haskell or even Clojure, actually. Right. Um, yeah, so I was going to bring that up. Like, it sounds like it's kind of like you're writing Lisp with horrible syntax. It's not even like that. I mean, um, well, it's about Clojure because the only Lisp I really know, which yeah. some people would say isn't a Lisp, but we'll ignore them for now. Mm. Um, one of the great things about Clojure is polymorphism and how it does that. Yeah. So you have lists and you have vectors and you have various other data types as well. But most of the same functions exist for all of those and they're implemented in a polymorphic style. Absolutely yeah. fantastic. In Erlang, you have lists, you have ordered lists, you have dictionaries and ordered dictionaries, and the list goes on. And right. they each have their own module of their own methods for dealing with these, <laughs> these structures with their own names and their own way of doing things. Which, and, and some things are implemented and some things aren't implemented. Right. So very often you do find yourself bashing your head against the brick wall because you know that in Haskell it would be two lines or two words mm. even yeah. and you know in Clojure it would be a one-liner as well and Erlang you have to write ten sentences. Mm. Right. Yeah, so I think that's one of the nice things about Haskell is that you can abstract the algorithms away from the types very nicely which is like the power you see like he was talking about in the functional programming talk where I think uh, he's showing like he was showing the power of functions where you can abstract like just the filter or map and separate that from, the, that from the data you're working on. Like Haskell is perfect for that. Well, Haskell actually works for that too. I mean, I was looking at the Kotlin thing and going, well, I haven't got data constructors and I don't have proper function composition and I don't, there's a whole list of things in Kotlin that exist. Yeah, exactly. And to, for me, they'd need to exist for it to be a functional programming language. Yeah. And the same way I feel about Erlang as well. I don't view Erlang as being all that functional. Right. You have no guarantees about purity, which means you can't use functions and guard clauses. You don't have the ability to say there's nothing happening over there. So you have, constantly have to be on the lookout for things that mutate in the background. Yeah. And of course, you abuse gen servers quite a lot as well to actually manipulate change. Which is not a bad pattern, because you do the same enclosure as well, right? Yeah. But yeah, in, in Haskell, you do indeed uh, take the algorithm, put it over here, do some pattern matching on some data constructors, and put everything else into known data structures. And yeah. the world becomes a happy place. So have you actually written anything in Haskell? Like, because that's where I'm stuck. Like. Right. So I've started writing a MUD in Haskell. Oh, oh. right. Yeah. So I, I, I could have written another database, but that's, that's been done to death now. Yeah. Yeah. And it would have been quite entertaining. I decided to write an old school mod. So I think we could pro talk for that, about that for an hour. Like, do you used to play muds? Uh, I used to play muds, yes. I, and so. I remember how awful they were as well. <laughs> so you're improving them now? Uh, probably not. I, I think we're not going to advance much beyond you're on a dark and twisty corridor and they, they're <laughs> just the east, west, and north. And That's obviously the peak of creation anyway. So, <laughs> Well, I might try and do it turn-based. I, oh, yeah. I always found with MUDs online that a big problem was always latency and you'd, start, you'd keep macros and things around to help you navigate around the world, but then yeah. they'd fall over and break because you'd hit a, squ uh, a room where you'd be attacked by another player or a mm. monster, and then you'd spam a load of instructions to the console still, and then those instructions would all fail because yeah. obviously you can't do them anymore because yeah. you're in the middle of combat. That would lag everything up and then you'd die in the next scene. Oh, yeah. And that was, that was kind of awful. Yeah. So I'm going to try and do a turn-based combat, combat mode and solve, and solve latency once and for all in that environment. <laughs> Once and for all. <laughs> Once and for all. Yeah. I like solving problems. Yeah, it's a yeah, problem that no one has anymore because no, nobody, nobody plays mods. But well, they should. It's they a, should. It's, they a should. Thing. it's good for the imagination. Yeah. So, so did you um, hack on mods back in the day? Like, did you do like um, 
it, it depends on which mod you play, but some mods had like wizards, which which uh, were players that could change the code and so on. So you could be promoted to someone. You could, could be promoted to the moderator, and you right. could change the world. I never did that. I wasn't I wasn't hardcore enough. I was too busy writing code on other things. Right. So, so I, I, would, I would count that as one of the steps to that I had to becoming a programmer it was you know like hacking mods back in ninety two maybe something like that. Ninety two. I was I was I was seven in nineteen ninety two. Right. <laughs> 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 yeah, back in the day when the internet was not uh, the web. <laughs> like, yeah. Anyway, uh, mods aside. <laughs> um, why do you hate Angular? Why do I why do I hate Angular? Yeah. Hate's a very strong word. <laughs> so um, I hate's actually, a very very strong word. So I, I should say I haven't actually come across Angular before, but I um, I sort of talk about Angular 2.0 after your presentation, and uh, I have to say, it, it scared me. So it would be interesting to hear. If like Angular 2 scares you, I'm not sure what Angular 1 would do for you. Angular Scar you? <laughs> yeah, Angular, <laughs> Angular 2 is relatively sane, um, right. as, as far as frameworks go. Well, like, I guess I didn't see much of Angular 2. I just saw like the differences between 1 and 2 and the pitfalls. So My, I, it's my not problem a fair isn't actually Angular. My problem right. tends, to, tends to be back in the same vein as before. When you have a framework, the whole intention of that framework always seems to be to try and make X easy. Yeah. Right. To try and make it easy for people who aren't X to do yeah, Y. Yeah, yeah. And this, in this example, um, when I go to companies, very often the justification for choosing Angular is it's got a lot of support from Google. Right. Our developers aren't really JS developers, but we need to build JS applications. Let's go and do that with Angular because it will help us and guide us and do the right thing. Yeah. Which, of course, is complete nonsense. Yeah, yeah. Um, what they're attempting to do there is shortcut learning. Yeah, yeah. Um, Man, what they're trying to do is skip ahead to the point where they are able to build software without doing the hard work up front of understanding what is actually going on yeah. underneath the hood. Yeah. Not that you have to understand what's going on underneath the hood, because, of course, I don't know how the Haskell compiler works. I don't need to know that. It's not, right. not important. No. So, some abstractions actually work there, but... Well, those are actually abstractions, whereas yeah, I argue yeah, exactly. mostly when you talk about Angular 1.0, it's just levels of indirection. Yeah. yeah factory, factory providers, and yeah. God knows what else. Well, actually, with Haskell, there are some things, I mean, you're going to come across situations where you kind of do have to know. Like, one of the things is that Haskell is lazy. So I've, I've come into co situations where, like, I have some code, and it just takes tons of memory and takes tons of time, and I don't really know why. But then you start sprinkling like dollar signs all over the place, and suddenly it works. Well, sure, but that's one of the reasons why every single Haskell tutorial or lecture series or book covers that in yeah, chapter. Exactly. And that goes hand in hand what I'm saying with regards yeah. to upfront learning before you start trying to dive in and do things. Yeah, I've no doubt that with upfront learning you couldn't build good apps with Angular. With yeah, upfront yeah. learning, if you learned the framework properly, you probably could build good apps of Angular. Right. But if you're going to invest all that time and energy learning how to do something properly, you should probably invest that time and energy in learning how to program properly. Yeah. Because yeah. if you do that, then you don't need Angular or the framework because you've learned how to program properly. Yeah, that's yeah. that's the thing I keep thinking about all the time with all those so many huge frameworks that if I take the time to understand what my problem is, then I might have solved it by the time I'm able to say if that framework is a good choice for me or not. Yeah. Now, obviously, there's the argument there to be made that a framework gives you a common language across the team, blah, 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 yeah, et cetera. Yeah. But that's very often a very small part of the problem anyway. Yeah. And if you aren't going to sit there and induct new members into your team properly and give them time to understand your problem domain and your way of thinking and the way you build your application, then you have other problems anyway. Yeah, yeah. And the framework ain't going to help you. You're just, you know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't help at all. Yeah. Yeah, Again, shortcutting problems. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's this tendency to just gloss over the problems. You just go like, oh, learning is difficult. You don't have to learn. You just use this. <laughs> like copy paste. Skip system. to the end where you have a product already. Yeah. Come on, yeah. let's ship it. Yeah. It compiles. Yeah, ship it first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's really, it really problematic. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not a hate of Angular that I have. Right. You know, I. I I've been looking at Angular 2 and going, well, those are sensible directions to be taking if you're using Angular or whatever. But I think Angular 2 is another example of why it's a good idea not to invest heavily in frameworks. Right. If you look how different it is from one, for example, yeah. there's a huge, a huge amount of effort and code churn involved in bringing an application across from one to two. Yeah. Because you've invested your entire application into this framework. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of costs. And um, where was the gain? Where was the gain in that? Yeah. yeah. There isn't any. I started wondering why they. I mean, it feels like there are quite a few 2.0s around these days where you start wondering, why isn't this just a new name, just to make things a bit clearer? But it's like that with most frameworks. Yeah. You know, if, if you remember, are you, are you done net developers at all? Ever done C Sharp, ASP.NET? Mm, not no, really. No, not really. Microsoft at some point decided to retire web forms and bring out their MVC framework. Is it? Quite a few years ago now, yeah. right. huge uproar in, in, in the community over this whole thing because we like our web forms, we don't want to learn something new, we don't want to change the paradigm, change the way we do things, how are we going to migrate, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Well, it's because we've all coupled our code to these large frameworks and it's very difficult for us to move away from them. Again, same, same, same reason there. Yeah. If you have a choice, why would you couple yourself to, an un, to, to, to a framework? Why would, why would you do that? Yeah. Now, in the JavaScript world, there are plenty of alternatives to using frameworks. Yeah. In, in right. So, so what should people do, rather than? I uh, know. Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't do prescriptive. Um, <laughs> right. I, don't, I, don't, right. I don't do that. I can tell you what I do. Yeah. But I'm not going to tell you that's what you should do, right. because that's a whole other thing. Uh, yeah. So, what my team does and how I do things is we use npm for the most part to pull in things we need. Right. The only real problem with doing browser stuff is the performance of DOM manipulation. Mm -hmm. So we just use React for that. And, oh, right. and everything else is npm modules. So have you have you used um, om? It's called for uh, for closure. Okay, so this is when I say that every single time I've tried doing closure scripts, I found it preferable to gouge my own eyes out with a spoon. <laughs> yeah, um, it's it's never been fun. Right. No. And I've been using closure scripts on and off, or attempting to since trying to learn functional programming. So it's probably yeah. three and a half, four years ago now. Mm. And every single time I hit a wall of the compiler or trying to get a REPL to work properly or trying to get the integration with Vim working properly or whatever have you, trying to then get the um, build system to work properly so my closure project can talk to my closure script project, all of these things just, just make me raise my hands in frustration. And I find yeah. the easiest solution to the problem is not to write very much client-side code at all. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Which is normally the right idea anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's very rare you actually need a client application. You know, mm -hmm. if you're doing things properly, you build a service application and then maybe enhance it slightly. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, so that's another aspect of the thing. Like, I'm not really a web developer, like, I'm more back end side, so I don't really know the deal. But it seems crazy to me to use all these really heavy client side frameworks because you have to push those to the client all the time. So you end up pushing, like, all this code that you probably don't use. To the, to the client all the time. Like, why wouldn't you try to keep your JavaScript minimal? Well, I don't really care about that too much because bandwidth isn't really a problem anymore. No. My big issue with that is when you start building fat clients like that, how yeah. do you then target other things? Yeah. You know, right. your, what, your, what, what, what does it have in it your API doesn't? What kind of workflow have you built up on the client that is existing in, in your back end? Yeah, that's it's, a it's one. much better to build up these workflows and validation routines and et cetera. On, yeah. on the back end and then build a nice light front end to go along yeah. with that. You can still make it fast and shiny. You can still add some JavaScript to that to make things cool. But for yeah. the most part, you don't need to build shiny single page applications. I put that yeah. in quotation marks because uh, there's no, really, yeah. really no such thing. Yeah. So what do you think about React in general? I quite like it. Yeah, it's, I, I use it at work too. That's what I'm asking. I kind of like it too. It solved a problem that we had. Exactly. <laughs> and it solves only that problem that yeah. we had. It doesn't get in the way too much. Yeah, and I like how it's not very prescriptive. So I, I, I'm, I think the way Facebook came along and said, well, we use this style of architecture. Let's call it Flux for, uh, yeah. for, for better or worse. I mean, really, it's just hold some state out of band and yeah. listen to it for events and update it through commands. Well, fair enough. Actually, it's a domain model. It's a domain yeah. model held out of bounds, and the React views listen to that. Fair enough. I can deal with that. But they're not prescriptive, they're not prescriptive about that, which means when we're doing our simple UIs, and we have some very simple UIs, more complicated UIs, we don't need to use that. It doesn't dictate to us the structure of our application. No. No, it's really nice. It, it flows pretty nicely. And you, you notice if you're going against the grain or something, you need to <laughs> adjust, I think. Absolutely. Um, I work with some very clever people, but these clever people don't do client-side development. And they have in the past. So when I joined the company, they had a wonderful Ember application, and, and that wonderful is sarcastic. Yeah. It was an abomination, and it was 
impossible to work out which pieces of code were dead or not. It was impossible to work out what was actually doing anything. It was masses of events bubbling both ways all over the show and being <laughs> propagated to every other object. And huge performance problems because every time a event came in from the server, it would bubble down through 100 different components and cause these different renders to happen. And it was really quite horrible to look at. Uh. And the reason being that the UI is an afterthought because, to be fair, it's, it's true. The UI in our products is it's low value. Uh, our, our UI doesn't have business value, so they don't really care about it too much. I recently left one of those developers alone with one of our React UIs for three months without checking up on it at all, which in, in hindsight is quite irresponsible. I came back a few months later, and there was no tidy required because he had just followed the React way. Right. Nice. <laughs> and, and to me, that was, that was it at that yeah, point. That didn't you know, quite ha happen in Ember. <laughs> Yeah, you know, he wrote plain, ordinary code in JavaScript yeah. and rendered stuff with React, and life was good. Yeah. Because, you know, they're competent programmers. They write very beautiful back-end code. They, they write some pretty good C, if there is such a thing as good C, and, yeah. and yeah. it's arguable there isn't. <laughs> so because they're very good programmers, they can then take the, code, the knowledge they have and the skills they have and just write really good code in the front end and then use React to render stuff. Yeah. And that worked fine. Well, that sounds good. It is pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to onboarding new developers for that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Next question. You can do it. I believe in you. <laughs> <laughs> Too many notes, itis. <laughs> You, you look as unprepared for this as I am for most of my talks. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> like, yeah. Normally, we record a podcast episode like once a week, and we talk for one hour. And this is the fifth interview we do in two days. So I think we're hitting our limits. <laughs> <laughs> our like mental limits. Mental is power. Long, so, yeah. long since past. <laughs> It's us, it's not you. <laughs> exactly. Of course it's you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, naturally. Uh, so what else, except, like, do you do other kind of programming except front-end programming? Do you do... Oh, no, I'm, I'm mostly back-end programming. Oh, okay. Um, it, I know it sounds really weird because I largely rant about front-end stuff, but that's only because everyone seems to be doing front-end stuff. So right. it seems yeah. to be a thing to rant about at the moment. Yeah. It's a popular um, thing to rant about, sort of. So most of the code I'm writing actually is... Mostly Erlang, yeah, right. and it's mostly video workflows for doing transcoding and cloud nonsense. Mm. Oh, all right. All held together with Bash. Ah. <laughs> so I'm, good right. ba I'm a good Bash programmer. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's cool. cool. Again, if there is such a thing, which I don't <laughs> think there is. <laughs> so, to, in my experience, Bash programming is mostly like taking uh, code from the net and like copy and pasting it together and hoping it works. Ah, uh, see. That's because you've skipped the learning step. Yeah, right, that's, exactly. It's a brute forcing again. <laughs> and, uh, Not to bring things full circle again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there's a guy at my previous job who is like a serious Bash programmer who actually knows what he's doing. And it's just like, he goes crazy whenever he sees anything I've done. It's like, you have no idea what you're doing. And like, this is all wrong. But, but yeah, it's that. Like, I haven't actually taken the time to learn. Bash. But I imagine a lot of your Bash is probably not mission critical. It's something you did to make something happen once and not really worrying about things again. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 A lot of our bash actually holds our systems together. So yeah. all of our upgrade processes and um, most of our background work is done with bash. Right. So it's actually important that it works well. So when we write bash or when I write bash, I find it very important to know what the bash is actually doing. Yeah. And to do that, you have to go and read the manual yeah. and understand exactly what it's doing. So did and you do that before or after the Haskell revelation? Uh, mostly after. Before yeah. then, I was copying and pasting things off the internet like yeah. everyone else does. <laughs> right. It's only after I realized, hang on, maybe I should learn what this yeah. does. So did and then you reach this level of ascension, which is um, not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> Every time you hit a problem, you go, hang on, I can solve that with orc and said. <laughs> and you know, you, 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 you've <laughs> achieved the next level at that point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and when, you know, when every single problem looks like something you can hit with orc and said to solve, and, yeah. and you know you've reached something, you've on, you're on something good. <laughs> Yeah, you've, yeah. Been, you've been affected. <laughs> Clearly, it's true, the hawk is, hawk is the ultimate hammer. It's like, <laughs> it's like oh, I, I can actually fix this with just some... I can apply <laughs> this to my thumb. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so, so you've seen a clear effect on how you write other stuff after Haskell as well. Then. 
So you ha you, you've seen a clear effect on how you write other stuff or think about other stuff outside of Haskell as well then? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. My colleagues would probably agree that my bash has gotten much better in the past few months. And right. I say I do write an awful lot of it. Our, yeah. our systems are held together with it. <laughs> it's not, that's not a bad thing, is it? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> So for the future, are you going to rewrite everything in Haskell? Haskell and PureScript, like that's the... Nope, I'm no. not. Right. I was saying this the other day, until Cloud Haskell proves to me that it can do the things that Erlang can do, it's probably not going to be super for what we do. Right. And also, most of what we do involves shuffling piles of binary around the place and doing things with those piles of binary. And I wouldn't feel comfortable doing that in Haskell at the moment because you haven't got binary pattern matching. Yeah. Right. And we, we utilize that exclusively for a lot of our stuff. So do you have a next language you're going to try to pick up or that's looking interesting? The next thing that I'm going to try and pick up, mm. I don't plan to pick things no. up. They just <laughs> come out of necessity. Yeah. Um, so it will hit you one day. I, I was thinking about quitting dev and becoming an ops guy. That, that could be a thing. No. Oh, I, yeah. You yeah. know? So. Yeah, that's the new thing, though. It's the new thing. You make lots yeah. of money doing that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like doing I cloud, that's the stand back, <laughs> I know Docker. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> Cue orchestral music. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, I, think, I think that about covers it. Yeah. Right. Well, thanks for uh, coming Being to the here, stage. Taking the time. Thank you for having me. I'm going to go get more, co more coffee now, I think. Yeah. yeah, me too. Good move. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>